Good afternoon and welcome to The Take Up. Today we have episode 155. What is commercial embroidery? Definitions and discussion. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome into this Education Friday where we're going to take on a subject that I've honestly taken on before. This is not something we haven't talked about, but it came back up in discussions this week and I thought it was worthwhile to discuss what is commercial embroidery? What is commercial digitizing versus, I suppose we would say craft or home or art or fiber arts. There's many different reasons why you might embroider. The thing is, I don't think that we're really dealing with one definition here. And frankly, because I've had experiences over my career that span multiple communities, starting out very much dyed in the wool in what I would consider a commercial decoration space, because I started out entirely on multi-head equipment, doing work that was business to business primarily. And I think that might be the definition most people are thinking about when they say commercial. However, I think there's something to say for a shifting landscape of what it means to be a commercial embroiderer. There are many things. We've talked about these segments before. From the people who are doing 100% massive contract embroidery, lots of throughput, not a lot of customer interaction aside from interaction with their direct customers who are other decorators or, or people who are selling apparel. To someone like me who is in a custom embroidery scenario where, yep, we're in a building, we've got tens of heads, certainly. Like I said, 60 odd is about the, the limit I ever got to as far as running the size of the shop that I was in. And when we're at that stage, there's more mixture because if it's commercial, Yes, it's commercial. We're doing commerce. There's a lot of business to business primarily. However, there's still definitely business to customer. There's definitely custom work. There are things that are, are what I would consider more creative that venture into fashion, that venture into something more decorative and get outside of the apparel space, depending on the kind of jobs you take on. And you guys know I work for a company that has a lot of home and craft embroiderers also using the software. Though I often get called in to deal with commercial considerations, I frequently am dealing with just people trying to digitize, alter designs, create text in such a way that they can make the thing that they want to make. And often it is just to scratch their own itch. It is creative in that way. But there's a spectrum in between there where we have this entire realm of commercial uh, processes and aspects that are, go from the kind of work that I was doing to boutique embroidery, direct personalization, monogramming. Those are all shops that exist. Then down to working out of the home, perhaps doing that kind of work that's similar to the other work there, maybe at a smaller scale, maybe not, depending on the people. There, there are all sorts of home-based shops that are fairly large in scope and in capacity. And then down to someone who blends the hobby, the crafting hobby, or the artistic side with sales and does things like craft shows or art shows or sometimes holiday work, table shows is what I often think of those because they're usually uh, set up in a table show kind of fashion. But we're still talking about taking money for produced goods here. They're really about these different segments. So the stuff we've talked about before to some degree, but I'm going to talk about my experiences a little bit more as part of this. And hopefully I can rope in some of you folks who are out here, some of you reciprocators jump in and let us know what you do in the industry, how you see it. And we'll talk about what those differences are. But I've got some points I want to make. And certainly I'm going to talk about the digitizing side of this because that's something that, uh, of course, was my entirety of my career I, throughout. That is the through line of everything I've done. You guys know I've also done cut vinyl and sublimation in the production side. I've done e-commerce throughout the entire my career as well, almost at the same amount of time as I've done embroidery. And I've had all of these other parts of my work that's been done, but throughout all of these things, even now, there's still a through line of digitizing and creating uh, digital assets for running the machine. So I'll definitely talk about what that is and the differences, but I would like to hear your opinions too. So let's say hi to a few folks who have shown up and are already uh, talking about stuff, asking questions. And I've got some other things I may have to bring up later that were put in before the show started, but we'll get to everybody. If you're in the hashtag replay squad and you're out here uh, watching this later, please still jump in the comments. Feel free to share your experiences because we would love to hear them and reply back to them as we get a chance. But let's say hi to some folks who are here. Uh, Barb saying uh, good afternoon. Hello from uh, once again, North Central Minnesota, Barb. Glad to have you in. Kingsbury Crafts and Frank Dunn from over in the UK uh, doing awesome work, sharing as always, and guiding this 
entire group, as well as his entire group, to more educational opportunities, which is fantastic. Uh, we also have uh, AJ Embroidery saying, uh, yay, Saturday morning education with Eric from Gold Coast, Australia. I hope you're having a good day out there and uh, glad to see you here. But everybody, jump in when you have a chance, when you want to talk about this stuff. I know I've done some business stuff lately. We'll get back to some more digitizing topics coming up shortly, but I thought this was something that was interesting because people were having some issues. I had uh, discussions with folks who were being, uh, honestly, they were kind of having trouble with people trolling them about their setups, about what they do, about what it means to uh, be someone who was in the craft side of things. Pardon me. We'll bring up some more comments later too. JC Productions has a couple of comments about what kind of machines we have, things like that. And I think this is also critical. So like I said, when we're talking about what is commercial embroidery, um, the place I come into this is several years ago where I had a discussion and, and wrote a, a blog post, honestly, that I'm going to put up here. And here's the link to that blog post. And in fact, I will go ahead and throw up a um, QR code in case somebody is watching this and you want to click that, you get up on your phone and you want to uh, grab that QR code. You can go ahead and check this article out, but I'll actually bring this up on screen so you guys can see it. Uh, like I said, if we have this stuff up here, we can go ahead and bring that up. And honestly, it's something that, you know, it's worthwhile to think about that commercial digitizing was a little different. And here's the deal. Back in the day when I first put this up, uh, the question really was about the structure of the final files. And I think that honestly, I come from a commercial space where there was a kind of a pejorative and even in kind of an insulting tone back in the day about what home embroidery was. And I'll tell you why this happened. I don't think there's anything actually wrong, of course, with home embroidery at all. In fact, I have a much greater insight about that now than I used to. However, this was the deal. When I was first judging contests, when people were coming to me with files in the kind of blossoming of the internet, bringing forth the ability for people and for customers to have their own files, they brought in stock designs that came from, of course, home embroidery websites. Why? Because most embroidery stock design sites that have any traction, that are selling individual pieces, they're selling into the home community because there's just so many more users. If you think about the number of commercial shops that are in, let's say in the US versus how many people have an embroidery machine that they've purchased, it's it dwarfs the home market, of course, one-to-one -one for design market dwarfs the commercial market. We have to understand that. The thing is, the great frustration for people like myself who are digitizing the commercial world is that things were attractive, the home designs looked good, but we didn't have the other part of it that we needed for commerce. And, and here's the thing that really came down to. It must run efficiently in production. And secondarily, I'll just say this, uh, a decoration that, that lends itself to being worn, the two things that caused us issues with er these original home designs when I first wrote this article were about the efficiency, certainly, um, and it was about the wearability. So what did they have? a massive number of color changes and or thread colors. And they generally were a little dense. They generally tended to be denser than you would want for a lighter garment. I mean, and, and lighter being down to sport shirts, which when I first came into the business, that was like the bread and butter item that you would stitch every day was probably a sport or polo shirt, whichever way you want to call that. So a sport shirt, a you know quarter a button down or sometimes quarter zip, but generally a button, a placket shirt that has, uh, that, that was, you know, usually made of a piquet fabric or a stretch fabric, something of that nature, golf shirts, polo shirts, spurt shirts, you'd be doing it all the time. And these designs were heavy and not to mention, like I said, usually too many colors for us. You also have to imagine in the era when I first came in, the most common machine you would probably see in, in a custom embroidery shop was a nine needle machine. And I started on six needle machines. So though you would say, all right, well, yeah, the home market are using single needle machines. Yes, but they're producing one piece. They are accustomed to changing thread if they're running single needle equipment. And the one piece is the goal in and of itself. And part of the time spent is in the enjoyment of making embroidery. And not everybody's going to agree with that. A lot of people who are in the home market too are just trying to make stuff and they want the stuff more than they want to do the process. Uh, sometimes I wonder why they're not hiring it out at that point if they really don't love the process. But that's part of the thing. The time spent is part of the goal. And I think what's really going on is that we're seeing a difference in goals. Why did they have all these extra colors? Because the attractiveness of the piece was much more important than the efficiency of the piece. 
And that's what probably makes things different. So in commercial digitizing, like I said in this article, we're really talking about the fact that though it has to be attractive and communicate what it must communicate, it also needs to be efficient in production because we're we're expecting to make hundreds or thousands of these pieces over time. Uh, we're expecting that we have to watch our profit margins, meaning that our labor is the most is the most massive cost we have. The amount of time we spend on something is the greatest cost. Thread doesn't cost anything like a human being sitting at a machine watching it. And I should know because I started out as an operator. Um, though I might not have been paid particularly well, I did get paid and I certainly got paid more than the machine got paid, right? Uh, even the machine leases as expensive as they may be had nothing on what it takes to put a human being in front of that machine. So when I wrote this original article, that's really what I was talking about. I'm like, man, when we get these stock designs and they come out of the home market, they are generally somewhat inefficient. They revisit colors multiple times. They generally had more colors than I would be able to fit, especially back in the day on a nine needle machine. When we went up to 15, it was less likely, though I have very much personally had to help someone reduce a design down that had 23 colors that we had to get onto a machine because we didn't want to rethread in the middle of a run and they wanted a giant jacket back that had a, a tremendous amount of detail. Um, have I ever rethreaded or had two heads on a multi-head machine where I swapped it over and I had a different set of threads on the second head? Absolutely, I have uh, In the when it is ne necessary. Otherwise, we really did a lot of tricks with blending and with stitch angles and everything else to try and elicit the look of more colors than you could actually get on the machine without having to stop, rethread, move, lose half of our heads to swapping or any other process. So I think when we're talking about what commercial embroidery is, the actual thing we're talking about isn't it a level of professionalism. That's what everybody wants to say. And in fact, I'm going to talk about my least favorite word I've ever heard about the craft industry in a minute. And I'll try not to dwell on that because that pejorative feeling was there. And, I, and the thing that I'm going to say also, I'm glad to say this, that pejorative sense of someone who has started in the home business or in the craft business has changed. The outlook has changed. People don't see it that way anymore. It's often seen as part of the hustle to do things on the side, to do it yourself and then build up. And in fact, even in the piece I'm going to show you in a second from one of the classes I taught, I have taught several times how to come from that home industry from the craft side, from the portion of it where you're doing this as a hobby that you love, a creative hobby into a commercial space and do that in the best way you can. And the fact that I've taught that means that it's been requested of me at commercial shows, at commercial trade shows that are traditionally a space for people who are going into business. Like I said, has not always been the case. Back in the day, there very much was this concept of, you know, the lowest common denominator four by four home embroidery machine you can buy from a big box store being somehow looked down upon as impossible to use for anything commercial. Now, I, it's not the best way to make commerce happen because of things like throughput and capacity. But I think we're starting to shed these concepts that the home embroiderer does not know embroidery, and especially the old school kind of mentality where it's like, oh, look at these people using weird materials. They're using so many colors, blah, 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 blah invariably the concept of the tools aren't as good and the people don't know as much yada 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 that stuff is starting to disappear because what we have seen over time is more people who are coming through that pipeline instead of the pipeline i came through which is getting hired into an existing company or being trained up to do commercial work from the outset it just is not as common especially in the states outside of the uh, I would say the commercial or contract sector, especially if you're coming into embroidery, there's a good chance this day and age that you come into it with some level of understanding of the craft. And especially because design is ubiquitous, the concepts of design, of graphics, of branding and merch are so ubiquitous and known to people now. It is not an alien thing to think about. Everyone who has ever seen an influencer, who has followed a YouTube channel, who has followed a Twitch streamer, who is on TikTok, knows what merch is. And when they come into the decorative apparel space, they often come to it with an understanding of what they want to get done. So I think it's changing. 
But where it started was this concept where the commercial world kind of looked at it and said, man, these designs are too dense. They're annoying to run. There's too many colors. Why would you do all this stuff? And if you come to this with a, like, ah, oh, you're running a machine that runs 300 stitches a minute. How could you ever make anything you make money on? This is ridiculous. And this kind of mentality, I think, sometimes hangs around a little bit. Because even after we still have people running on that kind of equipment, and after home equipment, especially the higher-end home equipment, is really, if not in parity with commercial equipment is in the ballpark of commercial equipment as far as what you can get done with it, even if the uh, speed isn't quite as fast or maybe it's not the same sort of robustness. It's hard to say that there isn't a nice broad continuum, a spectrum where there's a nice big gray area in the middle that doesn't have this clean cut line between what is commercial and what is craft. And frankly, being in the space, I have to tell you in the last few years, I've seen people who are in the craft world when they make attempts at commercial embroidery. It's not the stumbling that I once saw before either when people were using tools that weren't working, were using machines that were difficult to make them do the product they want to make. Uh, frankly, I'm seeing people who are coming at this thing and I, I wish that I were that good at the, the level of experience they have. People are coming out of the gate with their first projects looking uh, sellable. Let's put it that way. Uh, they're coming out of the gate with their very first designs, their very first projects on equipment that some people might look down on looking decent, looking sellable, and really being indistinguishable from what I would call uh, any kind of journeyman commercial work that you would do. So like I said, it's something that I just have to say. It's It really depends on how you look at it. And I think there's a continuum. And if we think about it like this, I'll, I'll start trying and kind of describe this graphically and visually because that's the kind of folks we often are. If you're looking at this continuum, we have a sliding bar here. There's this continuum between uh, you know, serving your desires creatively and also kind of a creative execution and perhaps a, the more efficient execution on this side. It's you know this sliding scale of how much time and effort we can spend to get where we want to get, right? So if we think about it that way, in the commercial space, we're spending maybe a little less time on the creativity, though honestly, a lot of my work was very creative and time consuming. Uh, maybe we're doing more work that has a tendency to be faster to do, more efficient. We might cut out excessive detail or color to get there. And that work in the strictly commercial business to business, and I'm going to say logo driven or even uniform style world, that's going to be the kind of work. Whereas on the extreme side of the home craft and art, especially if we get into fiber arts way out here, creativity is the most important. The result is the most important. Um, the efficiency is secondary. If we have to do handmade processes or processing to something, we have to alter it, wash it, trim it, iron it by hand, do some other process to it. That is very expected and is okay for the outcome because we're making a masterpiece here or an heirloom. And in between there, we can go where there's people doing creative work, boutique work that takes a lot of that work. And if they are selling it, it is definitely costing more per hour, but taking them more labor to get there. It's less efficient, but it is particularly uh, well executed or fits into that niche. And there's space all throughout there for this to be a continuum. I think that's the thing. This is a spectrum. And I think that's it is a very useful thing to think about. But it just depends on where you're coming from and what your goal is. It's like any time we talk about success in any part of business or any part of creativity, your goal establishes that success condition. If the goal is the heirloom piece, the museum quality piece, more hand labor, more time involved is worthwhile because it achieves the goal. The look is the ultimate goal. The time is spent willingly and graciously in order to serve that goal and doesn't necessarily have to be paid for. If your goal is efficient commercial operation with the most productivity possible, with the highest profit margins possible, then you need to reduce your input of time and labor in order to extract the most value out of the sale. The success condition is based on what you're there to do and what you have to fulfill to get there. You have your own check boxes for that. And even in the commercial space, like I said, we can have contract down to craft table and anywhere in that space, there may be more or less time spent per dollar that comes back. And you might be happier as a solopreneur. If you replace the paycheck from the job you left to become a solopreneur, that can be a success condition where you're not looking to build a multi-million dollar company. You are looking to replace your labor somewhere where you weren't as happy with doing creative labor that you enjoy.
And that's fine. That's the thing. Those success conditions are yours to set. And I think sometimes uh, the place where I've seen it more is actually in print where it's like, if you're not on the grind, if you're not on the hustle, if you're not building your company, then you're died. And why are you doing this thing? And I think that's the thing is that in the embroidery world, it's a different world. We have people who very much, though, though printers enjoy doing print a lot. I just don't see the chatter look the same. The chatter about it isn't the same. The hustle grind culture isn't the same. In the embroidery world, there are more people who are like, I enjoy this medium. This is what I want to do. And what I'm trying to do is make that work for me. I want to get enough value so that tomorrow morning when I wake up, instead of going to the office, to the workshop, to the production floor, the other way, I want to go do my creative version of this embroidery game and enjoy that and make enough money to survive and keep my family happy. And if that happens, well, then that's cool. I think that's there is a, an entire spectrum there too. These are there to be talked about. Well, let's go ahead and say hi to some other folks who have jumped in. And I think that's the thing. If you are really doing this commercially, commercially though, uh, you know the commercial stuff has to be happening. You have to have efficiency, and that's totally the right call. Um, when I've judged contests, I've talked to you about this before. This entire uh, episode where I talk about judging contests for the for the commercial world. One of the things that I was known for, as smiley and happy as you guys think I am, I was kind of the mean guy sometimes because I would jump in and someone would make this beautiful piece that had a couple of problems with it. And they were very much like the home embroidery problems I just talked about. They were super inefficient. There was a lot of travel. Or I'd run the design and it would break thread. Or there would be knots in it. Or there would be textural issues that weren't fantastic or worse than that it was just super inefficient with the way it was working and when i looked at this piece it was warped it didn't look good didn't feel good it looked good from a distance but once i touched it there were excess density areas there were thread breaks there were problems then i think the truth of that was that that is not a commercial product why not because it wasn't beautiful in a frame if you pressed it and kept it flat and it was in a frame it was lovely work however the instant you put it on a person, it's uncomfortable. The instant you put it on your machine, you got thread breaks. Now I've got production line problems that are going to cause me to slow up. The goals are different. It doesn't make them better or worse. It's not a value judgment. It's the right fit for the thing that you're doing. So what I want to kind of make clear here is when people come to you and, and say either direction, either, hey, commercial embroidery is you know, soulless plodding through a bunch of logos, which, hey, there are days. <laughs> It's not entirely that. There's lots of creative work that get, gets done. We just have to make sure that we can pay for it and run it efficiently. And I'll, I'll show you some of my stuff and we'll talk about that. But if someone also says to you, hey, the home embroidery market or you know, people playing around in their basement and they don't know what they're doing, absolutely not. Home-based businesses are real. They are making money. Their profit margins can be better depending on what they're doing, especially because they have low overhead. And the goal's not the same. It's not the same game, but it, the thing is we are all tied together by the nature of embroidery itself, by the problems that we are going to encounter, the difficulties of making thread do what we want it to do, the materials that we need to use, and frankly, the equipment, despite the fact that it is different, and certainly some of it is just the look, other things, there are functions that are different, there are things that are quote unquote better or worse for a given goal about some equipment over others. The equipment is also very similar. You don't have to have what's in my you know, fake picture behind me. You don't have to have a massive multi-head to do what I would consider commercial work. And in fact, uh, the multi-head, I wouldn't say it is going the way of the dodo. It's not exactly becoming extinct, but there are there is an entire new class of specifically commercial shops that are not starting from craft, but are starting and maintaining fleets of single head equipment so that they're uh, able to do very quick turns, have different designs on everything and, and run small runs. So run these short runs, uh, small numbers, whereas the multi heads, we know we have to span up an entirety of, of every head has to be doing the same thing at the same time. This is really about your goals. But yeah, we have some other folks talk, uh, talking in, so I'd like to grab everybody in. Ramona says she made it. Thank you for being here, Ramona. Always, always great to see you. And I love to see you guys talking amongst each other. I won't read out all your hellos to each other, but love that you've come together as a community. Uh, once again, AJ says, AJ Embroidery says, uh, production line process is critical for sure. Absolutely it is. If you are in a commercial shop and you are not thinking about your process, your workflow, your throughput, or your capacity, uh, you're probably losing out. We have commercial goals. Commercial goals meaning that we need to make sure these, this thing is fast, adaptable, repeatable, 
and that we can continually get the value out of it that we need. This requires us to think about this stuff, including stupid things like just physical workflow, how, mach how, how machines are laid out in the shop, how we move garments through. And we do have to think about uh, creative choices. If we have more color changes, if we have more jumps and cuts, if we have uh, honestly excessive densities, excessive movement in our design, it cuts time out of our day and we have a limited amount of time to extract all the profit we can. So production line process, critical for a commercial shop, less for a home shop. But here's the thing I'm gonna tell you, honestly, if you want more time to do the thing that you love doing, still pretty important for the home design. And I find more and more that people have become able to curate these things. When I watch home embroiders talk about digitizers and stock design collections to each other, they talk about efficiency. They talk about color changes. They talk about breaks and cuts more than they used to by far. It used to just be, I want the thing. I want to put it on the machine. Let me spend the time it takes. My machine only likes this kind of thread, that kind of stuff. Now people kind of have a better idea of what's going on. I think it's true. And then Jarita says, for me, the realistic value is more important than all else, but I only make one of everything. Absolutely. Jarita makes wonderful painterly artistic pieces. They're beautiful, beautiful pieces. Um, I will say this. I haven't had a ton of call for it in my career, so I haven't made as many big, beautiful painterly pieces. Why? In the world of commercial embroidery, the way I came to it, at least the traditional definition being generally logo work done, mostly business to business, some business to customer that is primarily for commerce. It is for either uniforms or promotional products, something meant to promote a company or give them identity. So identity apparel as well. Even when we go down to school and team apparel, especially on the embroidery side, because of the limitations that it has traditionally, you don't do a ton of painterly work. Have I done some? Yes. Have I done lots of big jacket bags and creative stuff? Um, yes, over the course of a career I have, but if I look at people who are doing artistic work all the time, they do more shading than I have ever done. They do more painterly uh, blends than I have ever done because most of my work was logo work. And I think that's fair. And honestly, a lot of logos are made of uh, distinct shapes that if you made them black and white, you could still see in the outline what the logo is. Meaning that for me, uh, shape, quality of stitch, and efficiency was often more important than painterly, realistic color and designs. I think that's fair. I mean, that's a fair thing to say. But yeah, love to have that going on. Uh, Cindy says... I have to say, it uh, looks a lot harder on the home side. I just got, I got tired loading just in 35 colors. Imagine changing the spool out 35 times. Yeah, absolutely. Now, what I'm going to say is, um, whereas we might be doing that production repeatedly, if you're only doing it once, and because the machines tend to help you a little bit, there's, there's some kind of stopping. You may come back and forth to it. The time might not be as important. You might be doing something else with your time. If the design runs well, it's not likely you're sitting there watching it like a hawk the way we kind of do. And we do a little bit more in commercial production where we sit, stand at the machine and watch it. There is also that. There is the concept that you might not stand at the machine. You could be doing something else. And frankly, having seen advertised machines where it's like, here on your tablet, here's an app where you walk away from your machine and it'll tell you if it stops running or anything, you check in on it. And I, I mean, my eyes rolled into the back of my head. I couldn't believe it because we would never, I would never leave a commercial machine entirely unattended. Now I know people who do. Um, I have walked away from a commercial machine and walked back, but the chances of me being entirely off the production floor and, and just kind of every once in a while looking to make sure it's still running on an app, uh, absolutely zero for the way that we used to operate. So like I said, it's just something different. It's a different world, but you know, that's the thing. It really just depends. And you know, it really depends on, <laughs> on what your goal is and what you expect out of the process. But yeah, I agree. Um, for me, loading in 35 colors one at a time, I have a hard time sometimes making myself use single needle equipment, even though I know that the stitch quality is going to be fine. I, I constantly kind of long to be on multi head or multi needle equipment when I happen to be testing something on single needle. Um, in my current life, I do both. But at the same time, when I'm doing that, there are times where I'm like, man, I don't know how, how you would want to do this. The thing I have to remember is I'm testing something to get it out of the way because I'm doing production. I want to get something made or tested. If you're doing it and you're thinking about the process, you're enjoying your creative life with what you're doing. You're enjoying what it, you know how it looks. And you can walk away and come back and you feel pretty uh, 
pretty confident it's going to turn out all right, that you're not maybe analyzing a piece that you've made because you're desperately trying to make sure everything is you know, all your ducks in a row because someone else is going to use that file like digitizers do, then you're maybe not staring it down the entire time like I do. And I'll, I'll tell the story I told a million times. Everybody says <laughs> that I, if you watch me watch a design run, uh, I'm fairly intent. And the joke has always been that um, it's a good thing that I wear hats all the time because this is my last... <laughs> my last line of defense against falling in the machine because I will watch a machine so intently as I lean forward uh, back in the day when the take up levers were exposed. Uh, and I have literally had this happen before. I'll lean into the head staring so hard that the take up lever will start hitting me <laughs> in the cap bill. And as it does, so I get my last chance to back out of the machine before I fall headlong into it. The thing is uh, it really happens to be a, because as a digitizer, especially somebody who's running something that must be super efficient, and when I'm going to release something into the world where someone else is going to use it, I'm watching all the stitches form because I want to make absolutely sure that I don't have excessive travel, that I don't have any problems with short stitching, I don't have problems with excess density anywhere, or uh, stitch penetration points being too close together so I can eliminate as much excessive movement. Or if I, I have like start and end point problems, pathing problems, copy paste errors, I have to make absolutely sure that when I release a file that we're not going to have those things happen because I'm expecting that someone else, especially if I release it into the home community, is going to put it on their machine and uh, blissfully walk away from it. And if they're going to do that, then I need to make sure when I'm doing my part of the creation that I don't. But that's the thing. It really depends on what you're doing. Or if I'm developing a technique, I'm working on something new, I'm working on a blending technique or a filling technique or some sort of detail that I'm not entirely sold on. I don't know every single thing about it, or I'm trying to push a different kind of look that maybe I want to analyze, then I'm going to watch every stitch run because I want to see how it's going together. And that's how it is. But that's a different kind of goal, you know? That's a different kind of goal for everybody. Uh, Lisa says, good afternoon. Uh, important to see set your goal. As you say, absolutely, really depends. Uh, Maureen says, home embroidery here. So nice to hear you address this learning every project in your video. Love it. Yeah, that's the way to go. Uh, learn, honestly, commercial embroidery should be learning on everything as well. But you know, it depends. Uh, Pam says, decided against a multi-head machine because I don't want to have work, want to enjoy the experience of creativity. Totally fine goal to have. Totally fine goal to have. And I'll also say that um, even if you're someone who's fully in the commercial industry, and I'm going to say this uh, as I'm speaking to myself to some degree, um, make sure that you're doing self-directed projects that are creative especially if you came into this loving it and then you find yourself starting to get dragged down by the grind of continually producing, stop, make something that you think is cool. Part of what we did this for at some point in this motion, even if you were doing it for the money, some part of it was like, man, that's cool. If you've hung on to it for any period of time, you're like, man, it's cool to make stuff. Well, make sure you take time to make something cool. It's going to reinvigorate you. And if you do self-directed projects, you can try new stuff. You can try multimedia. You can try different digitizing techniques because it's not for someone else. You're not following a creative brief. That way you get to play, but you also get to develop your skill and work on things. Plus, yes, you might, if you're like me, you might beat yourself up if something doesn't turn out right. Uh, but it's not for a client. You can release some of that excess you know, concern about where it's going and just make something and try it. And I'm also going to tell you this, guys, what you may or may not know is some of the products I've helped produce, even at Imbrilliance, um, my my portion of, these, of this production, part of it comes from, uh, I have an eye for things that I think are going to turn out cool, that are going to be good for the community, or that I see people wanting in the community and I get excited about them. I produce this thing on my own, sometimes as my own project first. There are parts of commercial stuff that everybody's out there using in our community right now that started out because uh, I, and of course, Lisa, who's here too, uh, made something cool that we thought was good. Or he had something really cool that he wanted to put together. And uh, in the end, it turned out to be something that was commercially viable. So, um, <laughs> sorry, I had a little error with with uh, stream right, yard right there. But suffice it to say, um, it, it can be born out of the thing that you just think is cool. And I think that's what we have to remember. Um, you you got to think about this stuff. So Cindy says, I've seen Jorita's work beautiful. Absolutely. She does beautiful painterly work and just large artistic panels. Love it. Love it. I, I need to make myself do some of that stuff. I have to admit as a logo creative, 
uh, as someone who thinks about it in design ways, I end up doing like typography and logos and very graphical work because that's where my center is. That's where I feel like I want to do creative work. Um, I, I make things that look like commercial embroidery even when I make them for myself. But hey, that's what it is. And like I said, I've done lots of painterly stuff. You guys have seen it. it. If I talk about all the stuff I've done, remember we just had the gradients show where I talked about uh, you know gradients and shading. If I bring that up, obviously um, a lot of this stuff is not logo work this isn't logo work it does have some painterly shading in it though you can see that i did limit the number of colors that are on it this isn't logo work this is artistic in its own way it is a representation of something creative um this was done obviously for the wildlife reserve this technically kind of is logo work but the little car and the mountains behind it and everything it was for a chapter meet but it's artistic it is more like a landscape and more like home style work that you might think of and honestly, even if I think about this, this was done for, uh, you know, for the national labs. Is this logo work? Yeah, yes and no. It's got blends. It's got creativity in it. So I'm not saying that commercial work doesn't have blends and creativity and texture and, you know, stuff that's very similar to what you might see in the home world. Hey, there's me making a little bird. There's the blue scale quail piece I did for these quail breeders. It's a lovely, lovely piece. This was done, believe it or not, as a logo piece for a dental place, uh, Papworth Endodontics. They had all these weird crackly, earthy textures and birch twigs and, and like and, and cracked end of a log and all this stuff. And they just wanted this really cool textural look. So is it logo work? Yes. Is there shading and textures and color in all of this stuff? Absolutely. So it's not like even the most graphical work doesn't have shading and texture and other pieces to it that are creative. Um, but at the same time, I have to say, if we're looking at that versus what some of the stuff we see in the home market, in other markets, there's just more of that. Now, like I said, I'm going to bring up something that I, I, I said I would kind of keep short and I will keep it short. Um, this is a slide deck that I, I presented a couple different times. And what I'm going to say is uh, from Creative Hobby Cottage Industry, this is where the original or where I kind of brought my part of this argument to the fight because I have long been someone who's made designs on the side on as I was doing commercial work for the home industry as well, even though I didn't understand it an inth as much as I do now. Even when I first started, as I was on the shop floors running the 12 head Tajimas that I talked to you guys about over and over again, um, even at that point, I had people coming to me asking, hey, is it possible to get a, a file for these machines? And I found out very early on that I could convert the sort of files I could make even on my earliest digitizing software. I could take it out into other software and convert it so it would run on people's you know, brother machines and husk varnas and every other thing that I had no idea about. I could make that happen. So I've been doing it for a long time. However, what I'm going to say is I have other people in my space who didn't love it. So I tried to teach all this stuff. And this is the least favorite term. I'm going to say it one more time. Uh, you won't hear me say this a lot. There were people who were calling people in the craft space craft holes. And I'm not going to call the person out because here's what I'm going to tell you. The very person who I heard say this first has completely turned around and realized this kind of channel of passionate people making gear that, that are doing really great work. And I think that that's where things have changed. Even since I gave this original presentation, this has changed. The outlook has changed a great deal. So I think that's the thing. I don't think this is happening as much anymore, but there are still issues on that scale. And what I'll say is it's like this. When we're talking about what is commercial embroidery. Um, I think the first thing we should think about is quit worrying about the term commercial as a direct line from the word commerce. If someone says it, we should understand, especially if they're coming from an old school, and I would say an old school commercial embroidery shop, the chances are it's not about commerce. Are you selling or not? What it usually is, is are you doing kind of the B2B work, the business to business work? Are you doing logo embroidery? And is it about efficiency? Is the work you're doing about efficiency, repeatability, stability, labor reduction? Are you working on your workflow? And frequently, the other thing that people are thinking, thinking about are asking, what kind of equipment are you running? Are you running a, tr a traditional commercial type of machine? Are you running iron like this? Or does it have plastic sleeves over it? And does it have additional tools in it? Does it run a little slower? Does it have a little smaller uh, field of decoration? And that's the thing. Are you running something that you can get at a, a sewing store? Or do you have to go have an equipment financer <laughs> help you get one of these? Um, I think those are the questions people are asking. Where there is something that is a realistic thing to think that's different, 
Um, certainly I'd say scale and throughput. So the scale of the business you're running, the throughput, literally how many garments can you put through your shop in a given day, in a given period? This is something that is critical. That Now, the thing is, it doesn't need to be a value judgment and it shouldn't be a value judgment. Because even in the space that I was in, there were contract shops that had a football field full of embroidery machines that were putting out a tremendous amount of throughput, but they probably weren't doing the same kind of hand-holding design work and customer work that I was doing at the same time. We could not put out the same kind of uh, literal throughput, the same number of garments, the same number of stitches per day. We're not going through my shop as we're going through a large contract shop. They're different and they're there for different purposes. Local commercial shop like mine handles a lot of local business, sometimes national business, uh, may, might be international, depends on where you are and how, how much of a distance that is. As I've told you guys before, uh, New Mexico is the size of Germany. That's one state out of the union. So in the United States, uh, doing interstate business is actually very much like doing larger, bit, maybe larger distances and more shipping than you might think. Um, but at the same time, uh, when we're talking about throughput, we're doing more local work. We're doing more creative work because we're handling a local area. We're doing more handholding, more customer education, more communication than you probably get out of the contract side where they're expecting the people to come to them with their understanding of what things can be. They certainly are going to do some customer education, but there's probably more customers for them that are either decorators themselves or are brokers of some sort that are going to handle all that interaction. Just make sure that at the end, they've got everything to the contract embroidery ready to rock. Um, whereas we were doing something that was more custom. Then there were people, like I said, who are doing their own lines, who are doing their own production for their own merch, that it's a very different thing because you're not answering a customer uh, brief. You're not having somebody come in and tell you what they want. And then you're having to come up and answer that brief, that uh, requirement, those requests that they have. And I think that's the thing. It's the way we deal with customers and it's the type of work we do that probably makes the biggest difference Though the one kind of sincere difference that I would say does still have some issues that have to be handled is just if you have the capability. So can your equipment run a certain size design on a hat? Not all home equipment, even equipment that has a cylindrical cap driver can run real tall designs or super dense foam as well as a commercial machine doing the same job. And sometimes they have literal, uh, literal restrictions on the height of the design. Uh, lots of the kind of entrepreneur or other smaller machines that are multi-needle home base machines that very much ape a lot of the same uh, techniques and tactics that you'll see used to create things in the multi-needle, you know, single head space for commercial machines. They may still have a reduced, um, a, literally a reduced decoration era vertically. That's something I've seen over the years. It changes depending on the machine, depending on the era of the machine. And certainly you have to know that stuff, but that's something that can happen. So capability is one thing. And then of course, like I said, capacity. So throughput, how many garments can I get out in a certain amount of time? And if you're only also, if you're only running one head or two heads, but someone else is running 10, they just have a higher throughput, a higher capacity than you do. Does that mean you aren't making money? No, it doesn't mean you're the right choice for certain jobs. And maybe that's the thing. Uh, somebody who's doing the same kind of work, logo work that doesn't have any variation or not a lot of variation on m many pieces, especially if it's not enough to go to a big contract shop, but it's too much for a single head shop. And that belongs to the shop like the ones I worked in. Whereas something that has highly personalized and belongs on a single head machine that takes more individual either creativity or just individual alteration. Every single garment is a little bit different or has a different name under it or what have you. Might work better on a single head shop or a, a shop with a small cluster of single heads that's doing this individually curated creative work that's definitely going to belong in that shop and, and makes more sense there though. Then we're going to have a higher markup on an individual piece and it should be because you are spending more time on the individual setup. And I think that's it. I think the other problems are uh, that people have these kind of leftover feelings about the home or craft market because of things they've seen or things they've been told that make them feel like there's a big divide there, but the work itself is very similar. And back in the day it used to be, Oh, they don't use the appropriate materials. And this is just not the case. Have I seen a home embroiderer use strange materials for stabilizer or toppings and things? Absolutely, because they're experimenting a lot more than we are. Does that mean they don't know what stabilizers are? Absolutely not. And in fact, I have found being in the space and Brian, a uh, creative and brilliance, Brian Bailey, uh, talked to me about this. He said, 
in his understanding, because he understood like commercial shops and cut and sew and other kinds of parts of the garment industry, is like when he worked with with the home market first, he's like they used more variety in materials than commercial people do. And I think we're starting to get where we're in close parity. More commercial people don't just have two stabilizers they know how to use. They're using multiple kinds of stabilizers, but home people have been using different kinds of stabilizers and materials to get the effects they want for a very long time. And now I find that because sourcing isn't as hard that with the world of online shopping as it is, uh, and as much as sometimes I like to curse them as Amazon um, has come out with every single kind of material you can imagine at the touch of a button, if you can tell what it is, if you know what it is you want, people are using different materials to get the effects that they need. They're using stabilizers. It's not coffee filters and trash bags the way it used to be, even if people are still playing with materials and using things that are not standard uh, to what we do. Most of the time when you see people talking about the home market, they are using the right materials, right? They're using appropriate materials made for embroidery more often than not. And in fact, they're employing them to great effect. Um, are there still differences in our equipment? Yes. Are there differences in the goals that we set? Absolutely there are. If you're making one masterpiece versus a thousand pieces, you've got different goals in mind. But what I'm going to say is that the divide has become less in the technical sense. And maybe what we need to understand then as it does tie us together, we understand the limitations of embroidery. We understand the limitations of our medium is seeing where the right fit for things are and also understanding that if someone's success condition is making something for their family, that's a fine success condition. If their success condition is building a multi-million dollar shop, that's a fine condition to get to if you want it. The thing is you're going to get there in slightly different ways and it's fine. And either one of you can go either direction. I've seen people with shops who decide to retire, but keep a single head around and start doing all kinds of creative work and flourish in a secondary artistic career in embroidery. And I've seen people who came up making baby onesies on a single needle machine and having to turn all the material out, go get themselves a commercial machine. And it, after a while, they start to bust out of their two car garage with multiple single heads and end up opening a commercial shop. All of these things are possible and have happened. I've known the people who've done these things. <laughs> so it's not alien, it's not weird, it's not impossible. The, the matter at hand is, can we inspire each other across the entire span of what embroiderers do? Can we inspire each other to make better work? Can we elevate our technical knowledge together? Can we then, when people wanna be in business, help them be in business and not only be good stewards of the craft, but understand the right ways to price, the right ways to handle their values so that they're getting a proper exchange for the amount of awesome work they're putting out there. And at the same time, can we, as people who are commercial, when a home person does want to get more efficiency, get more repeatable outcomes, come to them with the same energy we would give somebody else on another shop floor like ours, ours and say, here are the things I do to get a repeatable outcome that's efficient and works every time and not worry about what machine they're on until it makes a difference. <laughs> that's the, I think that's the thing. Are there things that are different? Yeah. Uh, square home embroidery hoops, if they're not magnetic or a little weaker in the sides. Um, so are square hoops traditionally for commercial embroidery machines, any square hoop. The thing is more home embroidery machines have square or rectangular hoops than commercial machines, which tend to be round for the smaller uh, tubular hoop sizes. They tend to be circles. They tend to hold better than a, a rectangular hoop. Some clamps will help with that. Magnetic hoops will eliminate it. There are things that are different about our setups, but largely the process we're going through is the same. And if we look to that process and understand the individual stitch as it runs, we'll understand all of it. Let's go ahead and grab a couple more comments here and just say it. Um, but we have a couple of people talking about stuff. First, uh, we have uh, Lisa Shaw saying, I remember uh, stitching 147 thread changes on my six needle was a thing. I don't think I would ever do again. I'm more excited about carb, texture, few color designs, less colors, but interesting to look at. Uh, you and I are simpatico as always. Um, I really do love the texture of embroidery because for me, and this is just, I'm, I'll go ahead and give you guys my creative feelings on this. I do love painterly work when I see it. For me, because embroidery is one standout quality that is not emulated by anything else is the nature of that dimensional thread. We have a real 3D object we're laying down and building with. So we have the able, ability at dimension we have stitch angles, so change in reflectivity of the light. We have real texture. 
because of the texture and dimension, the literal third dimensions coming them off the surface, the reflection of light we can play with the stitch angles, and the texture of either stitch qualities or the sheen of the thread itself, that physicality for me, because it is unique to embroidery, is the thing that I want to accentuate. And so I tend to be uh, lower color, higher texture and shape, very much like Lisa described. That's where I go because I'm like, man, embroidery in its classic sense, what it is, is about texture and dimension to me. Does that mean that the shading and stuff isn't cool? No, absolutely. It's super cool. When you get it to work, it's great. I've taught gradients so many times. I can't tell you. Uh, and a, a really lovely embroidered gradient is a thing to behold. It's lovely. Uh, however, when I think about what makes embroidery embroidery for me, texture is it. And so I tend to be a little like lower color, uh, lower color aspect, more texture, more dimension. But that's just me. And that's the cool thing is we have all the room in the world to be every part of that scale. We can make embroidery anything we want to as long as it's possible. And in the commercial world, as long as it's repeatable and efficient. <laughs> in the home world, we can be a little less efficient. We can make one standout piece if we're making a masterpiece and that's fine. And that's the thing, really depends. Uh, as Lisa says though, I love this. Yep, it's cool to make stuff 100%, it's cool. There is no time that you pull off like your piece, you know, make a patch and you pull it off the machine and go, man, that's cool. And I have this one sitting next to me. I got to quit showing the same Valentine's patch, but I pulled this thing out of the, out of the uh, substrate. I had it on a um, poly olefin material. So a, a plastic like material, pulled it out, heated it up a little bit. And I was like, man, that all made out of thread. And here's a patch. It looks cool. It's got a little shading and dimension, super simple piece, but I loved making it. And I still was like, oh, I love that. That's cool. Who doesn't like just pulling a patch out of a slab like that? That's fun. Uh, and Lisa Strauss, is, she actually talked about it. The jumping mouse is not logo work and <laughs> inspiring to so many. Well, thank you. Uh, Julia says, love the mouse and learn so much for it. And Pam's like, explain the jumping mouse. Uh, because I actually have it where I can bring it up on screen. I think I've actually got it here where I can show it if I remember <laughs> where it's at. Let me grab it real quick. In my shading ingredients piece, I think I've got it sitting there. There it is. Um, I'll go ahead and pop it on screen. This is the famous jumping mouse. Why is it famous? Because Eric doesn't make as many pieces as he used to. So I keep showing the same pieces over and over again. Um, the reason I show this one the most isn't because I think it is the most fantastic and brave of an animal ever. It's absolutely not. People do much better pieces. The thing that's interesting about this piece is it's mostly made with fill stitch objects instead of manual stitching, meaning that in the classic commercial style that I'm talking about, this was very efficient for me to make and is does not require me to do a ton of manual digitizing. Uh, most of the shading is done with fill stitch blocks and only some of the shading is done um, in a more manual manner. So when we're looking at our little jumping mouse friend here, most of these shading blocks are in uh, fill stitches with texture work on top, just done with a little bit of manual stitching to break up the regularity of the fill stitch and to give you more texture. And the thing is, I, I think it's inspiring in a degree, not because it's awesome, awesome embroidery that everybody should be, you know, praising. I don't, I see people who do so much better at animal work than I've done here, where they're adding more color, they're adding more detail, they're putting in all these uh, lovely textures and patterns from their individual stitching that they're doing. They're doing manual stitching and fur patterns and, and pelts that line up nicely. However, this one was done with a bunch of fills and so I could do this efficiently and I brought it to the commercial space. It's very much like most of my pieces where um, I love this piece, not because it's oh, it's some beautiful piece with the crane and everything. It's fairly simple. The thing that I love is that this tree that's in the background here is made up of two blocks of fill, a little bit of manual work that was done for the branch and the tree, and just a little scattering of manual gold stitches on top that looked like leaves. For me, it's always the less is more version of the thing that's impressive to me. And that's why is that? Because I was a commercial person, what, what my goal always was, can I fit the most value and detail in the time that I'm allowed to work on this piece? Is this the best mountain scene you've ever seen or the best uh, Stingray Corvette you've ever seen? Absolutely not. Um, there are people who are doing finer detail work and especially who are controlling every little stitch to make their scenes look good. What I'm going to tell you is, and I'll, I'll zoom back, I can see it. When you see wa somebody walking up at the handshake distance three feet away, this piece looks good. It's not a whole lot of stitches. It lays really nice on the garment and it was within the budget that we had for the customer. That's the difference between the commercial side of this thing. If I really have one thing to say is different, it's that um, number one, it's more than one thing. Number one, the brief, the thing that you are intended to do is set by the customer and is controlled by um, their willingness to spend as well as their artwork. So your 
the target is the look that they want. And it is what you can do within the budget, the time allotted, and while showing the artwork, they you know, ex exploring the artwork they have to make it the best employer you can, what can you do to make that work and keep it efficient on your machines and running cleanly? That's the difference. Commercial side is I've got a customer brief and the customer brief is telling me what I need to get done. I have the needs of the shop. It has to be efficient and run cleanly and run nonstop without causing problems. And I'm doing that within a budget. If I can get all those three things to line up, the best version of that is an efficient running design that doesn't have any stitching it doesn't need to have. It is made for sure for wearables and feels nice. It looks good, but it runs cleanly, runs efficiently, doesn't require any labor out that is outsized or extra. Do we do stuff outside of that in the commercial world? All the time. We often do things that I like to call art projects where we love them and we take them on and we do them even though they are not as profitable as something that is more efficient, but we do them because we like the customer. Sometimes we just don't get uh, quite as much out of them. Like I said, I'm having some weirdness with the, that prod that up again. That is now uh, the second time that we've magically got my samples back. Hey, uh, maybe StreamYard just really likes embroidery and wants to show you these guys. But uh, suffice it to say, is all of this work uh, super simple and super efficient? Not necessarily. Not all of it's super efficient. If I go through everything that I've got in here, you know, um, targeted tests that we did, if we're talking about, you know, columns and lines, we're talking about gradients and stuff. Is gradient work super efficient to digitize? Absolutely, it's not. It takes way too long. Uh, that's not necessarily the most efficient way we can fill a space. At the same time, is it lovely to see a rainbow gradient in a two-inch letter? Beautiful. Uh, but it's not always the best call. And sometimes we get in between. Like I said, I showed you some pieces where it's like, I've done the most I could with the least amount of input. And I think that's fair, you know? Uh, we do all kinds of different work that is not always the same as everything else. I've done lots of little weird creative things. My 3D dragonflies that I'm always showing you guys. I talked about this odd work before. The the Gilly Loco Salsa company want, needed our weird backing where we did this applique I showed you last week where we've got all the textures that are in it. Uh, the weird textures inside of this patch. Is it the most efficient way to make this texture that's in here with the overlap satin stitches? No, it's not. There's no automated tool for that, or at least there isn't uh, as of this recording that I've used. So I had to draw all those individual columns of satin stitch. Is that efficient? Not necessarily. Is the texture worthwhile? Yeah, the company or the customer really loved it. And then sometimes there's also creativity that's in service of efficiency. And so when we look through some of this stuff, you know, here's the other one, low stitch count items that required some thought. Well, we can do things with multimedia that are interesting. Or uh, like one of my first contest winners, the uh, Albuquerque International Balloon Fiesta had to make up time and didn't have a lot of budget. So I made them these big jacket backs with these balloons on them. And you can see when you zoom up close, contour fills with almost nothing in them, very light stitching. Why? Had to do them fast, had to do them cheap. Now this on denim did not look nearly as good. The original had a solid color block behind it. So you got to see more of it. Um, but when you're looking at this thing from a distance, especially on a solid navy color block, which is the original uh, design brief, if you take a look, it looks more like this. And this one's got a little bit of the colors amped so you can see it. We had this lovely gradient down to where the uh, stitches get tighter. And then we have that beautiful metallic thread that's under there. And the metallic thread's doing some awesome heavy lifting by that flame looking shiny and sparkly underneath it. So do you do creative work as someone who does stuff for the commercial world absolutely you do some creative work why why wouldn't you and in fact same thing here though this is a modern version that i did from brilliance which by the way you can go download for the fourth of july it's out there on the brilliance project site now the original version of this was done because i had to put designs on sweatshirts that had to go out the door and i wanted them to be inexpensive to run and quick to run so i made an embossed design like this uh, and it was less than 8,000 stitches to cover like an eight inch square on a center chest of a of a sweatshirt so what was I doing? I was using those limitations of, I have to make this thing run quickly. I can't use too many colors. I can't use too many stitches, but it has to look attractive. Well, we made some cool Americana and we sold a bunch of those. To tell you the truth, they went into like Walgreens stores back in the day. They were for department stores and for big box stores. When you're doing that, you can't use too many stitches. You have to have something light. Does it mean you don't do creative work? No. What it does mean is the goals are different. The goals are going to be different for everybody. So, I'll, you know, like I said, when I first wrote this piece, when I said, all right, commercial digitizing looks aren't everything, I was I was rabble rousing. I'm saying, hey, all of these designs that have 300 colors in them, 
just isn't what we do as commercial digitizers. So get your head on straight. You got to make this thing efficient so it runs right. In my world, that is absolutely the truth. In the world that I'm in now, I'm working with a lot of more creative people who are doing things on their own as well. And their goals are different. Their goals are about getting the look. And what I've found is the things I learned trying to be creatively efficient are still useful to teach somebody who's just trying to be creative to get a texture, to get a color, to get a gradient, to get shading done. Because the essential nature of the embroidery itself, especially when we're talking about digitizing, is the same. The essential nature is the same. It is not different in what we need to get done necessarily, or certainly not different in the understanding of our medium. It may be different meaningfully in what kind of things we choose to do and what our goals are. And, it, and certainly our, in, our setups are different in their capacity for throughput and what we can take on, what we can achieve. If you've got only a flatbed machine, you're going to have a hard time doing certain tubular stuff that needs to be, uh, remains tubular in the system. And you have to like roll it all out of the way for your flatbed home style machine. If you've got a commercial machine, you can do certain things you might not be able to sell on a home machine. At the same time, if you have a commercial machine, you might find yourself to be uh, certainly on the bad end of having to find technicians to repair it. And if you're trying to do things like mobile embroidery, I've talked about this before, there are tons of fully commercial companies who, when they're doing on-site personalization, like monogramming small design work or lettering, and they're doing it in a store as a pop-up shop, they will bring what we would consider prosumer home machines rather than big commercial machines because they can be carried, they can be thrown in an elevator and brought upstairs. Sometimes they can be carried by hand. The smaller tabletop machines can be carried. They're 80 pounds and a couple people or, or somebody who's got a little back in them can haul that sucker up to the production floor, set it up on a table that's already there and do embroidery live. There are reasons why we choose the equipment we do. It's not one person's a real embroiderer and one's not. It's not somebody's really commercial and somebody's not. We should judge these things based on the goals we have. If my goal is portability for simple embroidery inside of a retail location, I'm going to have a different feeling and I'm certainly not trying to truck one of these in. Might I bring the single head version? Maybe. But I'll probably do something smaller than uh, this guy on. Like I said, I guess, like I said, StreamYard decided today that it just wants to show whatever's on off screen here. So once again, did not click that. <laughs> that is entirely StreamYard causing issues. If you want to read the article, there it is. But uh, honestly, this is the deal. Um, when we're talking about these differences, and I think we'll probably keep this a shorter show today and not go for another half an hour. I think that the adequate question we have when we're saying, what is commercial embroidery and why does it matter to us? Most of the time we're asking that is because someone has tried to tell us some version of what we're doing isn't the right version <laughs> or we're not coming about it the right way. And I'm going to just say that uh, you can tell them from me <laughs> if you want it to be from some guy who's an expert and I'm putting as many scare quotes on that as possible. If you're listening to this and not watching, I am making little finger scare quotes all over that thing. Um, if you want to tell them what an expert thinks about this after a 20 plus year career in the business, uh, the right way to handle embroidery is the way that fulfills your goals. <laughs> and your goals may differ depending on the kind of shop you're in, what vertical that you're, you're actually trying to serve, the customers that you're trying to serve, and the particular project you're working on. I have in my commercial career used a home embroidery machine to make a strike off single piece on a random day where I couldn't get to the shop and sent it for a sample. I did that before I really thought home machines were okay to use. And certainly when the stigma was still strong. Why? Because I understood that if I made it out of thread and it looked right, it really didn't matter, especially to the customer where it came from. But I also understood the trade-off. I was at home with no access to my commercial equipment and thought, you know what? The time it's going to take with a much slower machine to run this sample was worth it to me because I can do it while I'm doing something else in my home and I'll bring it into the commercial world and it was fine. I understood the trade-off. The trade usually is about equipment, capabilities, throughput, and then we start talking about those trade-offs we have with our goals between creativity and time spent and the profit we can extract from the piece. If that's not your goal, that's fine. 
And not only fine, it can be desirable. You may desire to do a complete and total masterwork that takes much more time than I could ever tolerate as a commercial person because what you want to do, your highest goal in this thing is to leave a masterpiece of embroidery behind you and it has nothing to do with commerce. Totally fine. Also, your version of commerce, your version of commercial might be, I'm making pieces that I love, that I feel are of a high enough quality to sell, and I'm selling them at a higher price, or I'm selling at a price that I'm happy to, to set. Because I have a creative vision, I, I want to share these things with the world, but I do need money to get in into my hands so that I can keep doing this and survive. The art and merch side of this can be very different from the other side that I'm talking about. So when I say commercial, what's my stuff? I'm getting a customer brief. I have some definite things I have to work on. The budget's not set by me, it's set by the customer. Though, I mean, I'm quoting them and letting them know what's possible. They're gonna have the last say on all of this, including the creativity to a large degree. Um, I developed a lot of trust with my customers. So they eventually let me do a lot of stuff. They let me get away with things that uh, I've had other people in the in the business say, I can't believe they let you change their art so much. Uh, I had that literally yelled at me, not in the nicest way. When I was giving a talk at a shirt lab event, I had one of the greats of screen printing stop me to ask questions while I was still speaking because he could not believe how much I had changed art on the brief because for print, it's very different. The world of commercial print uh, the fidelity to the original art is paramount. Whereas I was making grand, grand scale changes in order to get um, texture in the embroidery and creative execution through what thread can do. So yes, that's there, but I got away with it because I had to educate customers into it. And because I made them believers in embroidery over the period of time that I was talking with them. Um, but that's the thing. Even then, in the end, if they didn't like the direction I took, they have the last say, they're determining how it's going to look. So even someone who's in, let's say anything from merch as a designer, say you're a designer artist who moves into embroidery to make your own merchandise that is from your art, you set the brief, you set the budget of time and effort and materials you're willing to put into it, and you're setting price. Now, certainly that where the customer gets to have their input there is will they pay for it or, will, or won't they? And that's where we have to work with price and with your profit margins to make that work. If you're someone all the way on the opposite side and you're doing completely creative work, your brief is your own. Your success condition is entirely yours. And that means you have a world of things, that, but without those restrictions, now it is open to you to discover what that success condition is for yourself. And you aren't relying on someone else to tell you, is it good, is it not? You have to decide that you've made it good for your own goals. So in this case, Commercial embroidery, yes, it's about commerce, but I think what makes it different is that we take orders. That's what it is. We're taking orders and we have to fulfill them. Whereas it's still commerce, it's still commercial embroidery in the most technical sense, certainly to make things yourself for your own line. I still think that's commercial embroidery, but it is a very different thing than custom commercial embroidery, which is what I think people often mean when they say it. And, and like I said, though there used to be a pejorative sense of the craft side of it, I think it's going away as there's more flow back and forth between the creative side of it and the commercial side of it. And as we've gotten to this point that some people who came in from that hobbyist side really love it so much that they want to make it their day job, um, as that's become more possible. And also as home equipment has become more like commercial equipment at the higher ends of the multi-needle spectrum so that people coming in really are not coming in with no idea. And in fact, I'll say this, uh, I love a home embroiderer for training on commercial equipment because at least they know how to run thread. They know what tension is. They know how to thread a needle. They know what the thread path is. They can deal with, uh, you know, stabilizers and hooping. That's a good person to bring up to a commercial machine if you're trying to bring them into a shop as an operator because they at least they know how thread and fabric and stabilizers work. That's a critical part of this thing. Whereas you bring somebody from the commerce side, maybe from the commercial side that starts from uh, design or starts from print or somewhere else and they don't know that stuff, sometimes it's harder to get them onto how variable and fuzzy the logic behind how embroidery works can be. So like I said, it really depends. Does this mean that uh, there aren't differences? No, we have different goals. We have different things we're doing. And honestly, the thing to take from that is not that, you know, one or the other of us is more authentic as an embroiderer, but that we have some things to teach each other. 
there's a lovely amount of creativity and experimentation that goes on in the home market that I have used over the years to inspire my work. And in the commercial market, there are people who are absolutely wonderfully detail oriented who make things very precise so that they run very cleanly. And there's a beauty to that efficiency as well. And frankly, on both sides of the aisle, there are people who do both things because lots of home embroideries don't want to be changing thread that much. Lots of commercial embroiderers get em embroiled in that technology and in the technique and want to make something creative and beautiful. All in all, the stitch is the stitch. Embroidery remains what it is. Uh, thread does what thread does. And though we do introduce new technologies that certainly uh, shape and improve our experience, we introduce new materials that make things more possible for all of us. In the end, we understand what embroidery is. That's the core thing that keeps us together. And if we start to look at designs, projects, methodologies, and say, are they serving the purpose they're intended to serve? And when they do, awesome. And sometimes we can look at them and say, hey, maybe the purpose that that thing was intended to serve on one side of the aisle uh, fits differently on the other side of the aisle and can help us. Maybe we look at something in the home, home market and say, wow, there's some automation in the home market that would certainly make our commercial jobs easier. Or we look at things in the commercial market and say, wow, some of that uh, throughput, some of that organization, uh, maybe some of the other technique stuff that we're doing here to make things efficient. Well, it certainly make my uh, project go a lot faster and cleaner on the home side. Maybe I want that because I'd like to get more embroidery time in or, hey, get some time to do something else and instead of watching my machine or rethreading it every time something breaks. I mean, there's, there's tons of stuff that goes between the two. And frankly, I think that we've gotten to the point where it's a continuum. I don't think anybody sees the big bright dividing line the way it used to be. Um, hopefully that means I can start... Um, retiring my decks of the stuff that commercial used to complain about, about home embroiderers, which I think is not true. You know, this is the thing you always heard. Oh, the execution's poor. They cut the prices too much. They don't invest in equipment. Uh, they're, uh, they have unfair kind of comparison to us. So they're distracting us because people they are giving stuff away to their friends. Um, as devaluing the product is reducing our survival and profit bargain hunting, all this stuff. I think that it's starting to reduce itself. And that's the thing. These are the falsehoods that I've always been fighting against. Hobbyists make poor professionals? Absolutely not. They know a lot about embroidery. And, and provided that their goal is set correctly when they come into the professional world, quote unquote, the commercial world, they understand that they need to make profit. They're going to be great because the, the technical stuff is less likely to be an issue for them. Small shops can't make money? Total lie. See tons of small shops making money and especially small shops doing specialty work. I know you guys saw a bridal piece there from a friend of mine that was in my stack. Um, bridal work, things like that, where you get to make these, these small run, small number pieces, but they're very expensive and people are expected to pay that and expect to be paying those amounts. They make tremendous margins on the work that they do. Also, don't fall in love with the process. If you don't fall in love with the process, you're probably not going to get good at the process. Y admittedly, there are people out there making better margins by being brokers who just take orders and then hand them off to a contract shop. Bully for them. My goal is to do something I enjoy to do with the limited hours of my lifespan. And if that's embroidery, that's my goal and it's part of it. Do I want to make money while I'm doing it? Absolutely. Would I like to do it with people I like doing a project that I enjoy? Absolutely. And that is a fine set of goals. Plus, the people who are the best in this business, even the people who don't do embroidery anymore, who do the best communication, I find are people who know the process really well so that they very quickly and precisely communicate between all the parties that they deal with as brokers to make things happen. So I think that's that's a BS argument as well. So like I said, hopefully there is a day where I get to fully retire then. I think honestly, we're close, man. We're close. This is really what it is for all of us to understand we are moving into a commercial space. Uh, yep, your ability is the price entry. You have to be able to do it to sell it. Professional embroidery requires profit. If you're going to do it as a job that you need to keep move money moving, then yeah, you need profit to make that happen. That's fair. And selling isn't a dirty word if it's going to be commercial because you're going to sell stuff. It's commerce. The thing is, it's okay if not everybody is in that space. It's 100% okay. Um, I think that there are there's room for those values of creativity and efficiency to be throughout the business. And frankly, I think everybody should at the very least, look to be as efficient as possible while maintaining the creative look that they're trying to achieve. And that all of us should understand the awesome value of what we do and get that value out of people when they're buying stuff from us, or at the very least, be able to communicate that value when we're giving something to people or when we are selling the idea of embroidery to the world. 
So with that, folks, I think I'm going to go ahead and stop right there. We don't need to go for another 15 minutes with me doing an all-out love fest about how we're all one big embroidery family. Do we do things differently? Will there be a little uh, back and forth between the different sides of things? Will there be somebody who uses goofy materials or will there be a commercial person who uh, uh, can't see past two kinds of backing and <laughs> doing all logo work? Sure. Like I said, um, you know, it's easy to see where it comes from. And I'm going to, going to go ahead and do the last thing I said I was going to do and just show you guys. I was scrolling through one of my archives and I thought about a lot of the work I did. And I was like, I was going to show you how there's so much logo work. And yeah, that's primarily I did. But then I think, oh, the three wolves rafting that had little wolves and the decorative idea and the canyon behind it. I remember doing that. And that truck. And then there was a little and bug stop jacket back. And it had all these different insects with these patterns and cool stuff that was going on. And it was a whole jacket back full of bugs. And I went, that was pretty decorative. And it was like, I was going to prove my point that I only ever did logo work. And I was like, oh yeah, but there was these flowers that I did. And oh yeah, that's right. There was this tree with the shading. I remember that. Uh, oh, when I did the tricentennial piece for that, that's really hardcore logo work. It's just lines. But then, oh, I did that Adobe building that I did for uh, these folks at the country day school. If I go through this piece, I'd say, yeah, is it primary logo work? Yes. Lots and lots of logos and flags and all that. But then there's little animals and there's characters and badges and, you know, geographic stuff. And there's little cherubs and there's all manner of decorative pieces that I did as well. But of course, as someone, you know, the Basset Hound stuff I did for the Basset Hound Rescue, as I scroll through and literally this, I believe this uh, one folder has about 16,000 files in it. Um, <laughs> some of them are repeats and edits and things like that. But, you know, yeah, lots of logo work. But as I look at it, lots of shading, lots of creative stuff, lots of landscapes. Um, n numerous pieces that aren't logos and lots of pieces that are. The thing that's true is all of this was embroidery. All of this required some creativity, but the difference being a lot of this I had to do kind of under the gun with the tools I had on budget. When I got to go off of that and do something that wasn't just straight on budget, something that allowed me to use more tools and allowed me to be creative, I did. And I loved it. And, you know, some of the stuff is just, you know, it, some of it was very creative, very painterly. Some of it was big and huge. And this was a, this big wrecker character that was on the back of a tire cover. I mean, we did all sorts of random stuff. But, yeah, somebody who's commercial, the likelihood is, though they're going to do some stuff like this where I've got animals and fun stuff and shading and all of that, a lot of what we're going to do is this other stuff you're seeing is logo work. There's a lot of flat colors. There's a lot of you know, direct lettering. There's a lot of just plain old couple of color logos and mascots and all manner of things. But that's the thing. All of this, certainly more of it, you can see being logo work and uniform and stuff like that. But certainly there's parts of this that were using the same techniques you would use at home. Maybe not with all the colors, maybe not with all the materials, maybe not with as much creativity, but at the same time, uh, thousands upon thousands of variations of all these embroidered files. And some of them are very creative. The one thing that remains constant in all of them is what the goal was. And for me, it was making my customer happy. It was making them have that ability or giving them the ability to show where they come from, what was important to them, uh, to let people know they were professional, to give them the ability to express themselves. As I always say, to let them quite literally wear their hearts on their sleeves to show what was important, to show what they built and what they belong to. And over time, it means you build up more and more of these various different things, certainly. But all in all, I did this for primarily somebody else under their direction. And that's really what probably sets things apart. But in the end, do I think just because I was doing construction loaders and logo work and, you know, various trucks. <laughs> Does that mean that any of this work is not, is, doesn't have creativity in it, uh, doesn't have pieces of it that are interesting and worthwhile? Absolutely not. I think there, some of these pieces are beautiful in their own as embroidery, even if they weren't necessarily um, specific or special or made to be creative from the outset. Uh, the execution was as creative as it could be for what I needed to do. At the same time, if you look at this versus what some folks out there are doing, if you look at Joe Rita's beautiful painterly work, you know, my simple yuccas and my simple pieces and the balloons that I did early on in my career for Wells Fargo, they look 
childish, like coloring books in comparison to things that are painterly and done for creativity as the end goal. At the same time, is there something worthwhile about the old mud volleyball pig or <laughs> the snorting Mustang from Mustang football or the native firefighters eagle with a fire helmet on? Hey, we I executed them as best I could. <laughs> In any case, folks, with that, I'll let you guys go. But thank you for being here this week. We'll get back to some more digitizing and creative topics, some more technical stuff as we go on. But I thought it was worthwhile. For those of you who have, for one reason or another, felt like uh, the work you're doing is not enough, silence that voice. The work you're doing is done for its own reasons. If it fulfills those goals, then it's enough. And, you know, let the process happen. Let yourself learn. And learn to enjoy just making cool stuff again. All right, folks. So with that, I'm glad we got to have this time talking and I can't wait to see you guys again with whatever kind of embroidery you're bringing next week.